Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us. My name is Kristen Seaman, AORN's Clinical Re Perioperative Nurse Research Librarian, and I will be moderating tonight's presentation on surgical attire. You will hear from two speakers. First, Lisa Spruce, AORN's Director of Evidence-Based Perioperative Practice. Dr. Spruce is responsible for the overall leadership, development, evaluation, and maintenance of the products, services, and guidelines for perioperative practice developed by AORN's Nursing Practice Team and AORN's Research and Information Center. Dr. Spruce was the lead author on AORN's Guideline for Surgical Attire. Then we'll hear from Caitlin Stowe, PDI's Clinical Affairs Research Manager, who has practiced in a variety of infection prevention roles and settings for over 10 years. Everyone's microphones are now muted, but feel free to submit questions throughout the presentation in the chat box at the bottom of the page. At the end of the presentation, we'll open it up for Q&A. All right, Dr. Spruce, take it away. Thank you for joining me today. The guideline for surgical attire has been updated since the last version was published in 2015. This guideline is published in the 2020 edition of the Guidelines for Perioperative Practice. It was also published electronically in eGuidelines Plus in July of 2019. If you are making changes to your attire policy, please make sure you are using the updated guideline. Today, I am going to discuss some of the changes that were made to the attire guideline, but not all of them. So please review the guideline in its entirety for comprehensive information. So first, let's talk about laundering. We are still not recommending home laundering due to the fact that it is not monitored for quality, consistency, or safety. Studies show that scrubs become contaminated throughout the workday and bacteria can be transmitted to the environment. Some of these organisms can survive home laundering because biofilm formation in home washing machines and can be transferred to other clothing washed in the home washer. What we don't know is whether or not this scrub contamination contributes to healthcare associated infections. So the recommendation states, Lawn or scrub attire after each daily use at a healthcare accredited laundry facility at the healthcare organization according to state regulatory requirements or the healthcare organization according to Centers for Disease Control and Prevention recommendations for laundering in the absence of state requirements. So we are giving you choices here that makes it easier to leave the scrubs at your organization and just follow state regulatory requirements for laundering or the CDC recommendations for laundering. And if you can't send it out to a healthcare accredited laundry facility, you have these options now. We want you to remove scrub attire before leaving the facility. The benefits of removing surgical attire before leaving the facility outweighs the harms. Low quality evidence supports changing out of surgical attire into street clothes when leaving the building to reduce the potential for healthcare workers to transport pathogenic microorganisms from the facility or healthcare organization into the home or community. Now, the, the guideline simply states to remove scrub attire before leaving the facility. Recently, the Surgical Infection Society has put out additional guidance related to SARS-CoV-2. And this is because we know that SARS-CoV-2 can persist for hours to days on inanimate surfaces, but it is not certain whether this applies to clothing, including OR attire. Now, the OR attire should be protected by your PPE if you're wearing it for a COVID-19 positive patient. The gown should be waterproof, so that would, should protect you. But the Surgical Infection Society advises to treat all OR attire, including surgical scrubs, as though contaminated, and suggests that an area be designated as close to the OR as possible for disposal 
disposal of surgical attire. Surgical providers should not speak to family if allowed to be present in the waiting area after a COVID-19 case until after personal hygiene has been completed and after changing into fresh attire. Families should be advised preoperatively that these safety precautions may engender delay. We know oftentimes that personal clothing is worn under scrubs. However, there was no evidence found to evaluate the benefits and harms of wearing personal clothing under scrub attire. Remember that personal clothing contaminated with blood, body fluids, or other potentially infectious materials must remain at the healthcare facility for laundering. But for this recommendation, it is a no recommendation due to the lack of evidence. So at your facility, you need to establish a process about the type of fabrics you're going to allow, such as non-linting fabrics, that you're going to allow to be worn under scrub attire, the amount of fabric that may extend beyond the scrub attire, for example, a crew neck collar under a v-neck scrub attire, laundering frequency, for example, daily laundering, and laundering method. For example, are you going to facility launder personal clothing or are you going to make people take those home for home laundering? Keeping in mind, again, that if it becomes contaminated with blood, body fluids, or other potentially infectious materials, it has to remain at the healthcare facility for laundering. So some facilities look at antimicrobial scrubs. And though the evidence regarding the use of these scrub attire is high quality, there is a wide range of variability in study results, and several studies were performed in the laboratory setting. Six studies found that the um, antimicrobial scrubs decreased bacterial contamination, and four studies found no difference between standard scrubs and antimicrobial scrubs. So further research is also needed to determine the harms of wearing surgical attire made from antimicrobial fabric to the wearer. So this is a no recommendation. So if you're considering antimicrobial scrubs, just follow your facility's process for evaluating new products. So long sleeves, this is a conditional recommendation. Um, the statement is arms may be covered during performance of preoperative patient skin antisepsis. There was only one experimental study that looked at this and it demonstrated wearing long sleeves specifically appeared to decrease the amount of micrococcus in the environment. The researchers recommended wearing attire with long sleeves when performing the intraoperative patient skin prep. It is still unknown if covering the arms impacts surgical site infection rates. We also know that contamination of the prep by loose fitting sleeves is a potential harm of wearing long sleeves during preoperative patient skin antisepsis. This risk may be reduced by wearing a tight fitting sleeve, avoiding reaching over the prep area, or wearing a sterile sleeve, which may reduce the potential for introducing pathogens to the prep area. So research is still needed to evaluate the potential harm and risk reduction interventions. Now there were no studies that looked at wearing long sleeves in any other area besides when performing perioperative patient skin antisepsis. So there's no recommendation made for wearing long sleeves in the semi-restricted and restricted areas. Now, at your facility, you may allow long sleeves for comfort if people are cold, or they may not wear them if they are hot, and just consider covering arms when you're doing your patient skin antisepsis. So this recommendation is in regards to cover apparel, and the recommendation states, if worn, it should be clean. So moderate quality evidence found that lab coats worn as cover apparel can be contaminated with large numbers of pathogenic microorganisms. Researchers have found that cover apparel is not always discarded daily after use or laundered on a frequent basis. So if you're going to allow cover apparel to be worn, just make sure you have a process that you're comfortable that it is clean apparel. So head coverings, this is a big change in the guideline for 2020. The recommendation states to cover the scalp and hair when entering the semi-restricted and restricted areas. No recommendation can be made for the type of head covers worn in the semi-restricted or restricted areas. 
So that's because the evidence does not demonstrate any association between the type of surgical head covering material or extent of hair coverage and the outcome of SSI rates. So an interdisciplinary team, including members of the surgical team and infection preventionists, may determine the type of head covers that will be worn at the healthcare organization. There is no recommendation for covering the ears in the semi-restricted and restricted areas. Now, covering the ears may provide protection to patients to prevent earrings worn by scrubbed team members from falling into the sterile field, which increases the patient's risk for SSIs and a retained item. However, we also know that covering the ears may have potential harms such as impairing hearing and potentially impeding team communication, interfering with the use of a stethoscope, and hindering the fit of protective eyewear or loops. So again, this is a recommendation that has changed. We just recommend to cover the scalp and hair. The type of hair covering is up to you and your interdisciplinary team and how much hair coverage you're going to um, allow and also whether or not you want to cover the ears. So lots of things to talk about with your team in this recommendation. So beard covers, we know that beards should be covered at certain times, so the recommendation states cover beards when entering the restricted areas and while preparing and packaging items in the clean assembly section of the sterile processing area. Several studies have demonstrated that beards can be a source of bacterial organisms. So you can cover the beards with a mask. Sometimes a mask is sufficient, or as you can see in this slide, this person has a mask in a, a beard cover in addition to it. So shoes, the recommendation on shoes is to wear clean shoes when entering the semi-restricted or restricted areas. Now the definition of clean is that you don't see any visible soil, dirt, blood, or anything like that. So you just want to make sure they're clean when you're coming in. Or you can also have a pair of dedicated shoes, but the recommendation is just to wear clean shoes. There was a systematic review by Rashid, and it showed that shoes had the ability to transfer infectious organisms to the floor and contribute to floor contamination. So, and you can also bring potentially pathogenic organisms on your shoes into your car, into your home, which is why it's a good idea to have a dedicated pair of shoes, but the recommendation is just to make sure they're clean. You also want to wear protective footwear that meets the healthcare organization's safety requirements. So sometimes, you know, you look at tennis shoes that have porous and they're easy to penetrate with a sharp object. That's something you probably don't want to wear. And wear shoes that are made of material that a sharp object cannot penetrate to protect your feet. So ID badges, you just want to clean those with a low-level disinfectant when the badge becomes soiled with blood, body fluids, or other potentially infectious materials. Determine the frequency for routine badge disinfection, for example, daily or weekly. You can determine that at your facility. And then if you're wearing a lanyard, you want to clean that also with a low-level disinfectant when the lanyard becomes soiled with blood, body fluids, or other potentially infectious materials. So the lanyard needs to be made of a material that can be cleaned and disinfected, you know, wiping it down. You don't, probably don't want to wear a cloth lanyard. So steth stethoscopes, we want to, um, this is a change in this recommendation, and it says that you can wear them around the neck. So that's perfectly fine, but you want to make sure you clean those stethoscopes before each patient use according to the manufacturer's instructions for use. So just before you, if you're wearing it around your neck, you take it off, you clean it, you use it on the patient, clean it again, followed by your hand hygiene. There are lots of studies on stethoscopes and how highly contaminated they are. They can be a source of disease transmission because you're using them on patients. So you can, um, the stethoscope can transfer to the patient, the patient can transfer it back to you, you can transfer it again to another patient. So just make sure you're cleaning them before each patient use, you know, and clean them afterwards as well and perform hand hygiene. So we know that tablets, 
computers, phones, backpacks, briefcases are all items that are now being brought into the semi-restricted and restricted areas. So you want to establish a process to prevent contamination of our areas from personal items. Um, and this process may include cleaning or containing the item or placing the item in a designated location. Um, cell phones were are highly contaminated with microorganisms, some of them potentially pathogenic. You want to clean them. You want to clean your tablets and other personal communication or handheld electronic equipment according to the device manufacturer's IFU before these items are brought into the OR and perform hand hygiene. Moderate quality evidence demonstrates that cell phones, tablets, and other personal handheld devices are highly contaminated with microorganisms, some potentially pathogenic. There was one case study that I read that demonstrated Ebola virus being transferred from a patient's phone to a healthcare worker. So we know that these potentially pathogenic, deadly organisms can be transferred on our phones. Researchers recommended regular cleaning of these devices and implementing hand hygiene before and after use. Reducing the numbers of microorganisms present on these devices may protect patients from the risk of healthcare associated infections resulting from the transfer of microorganisms from the devices. So very important to clean these and we know people are using them quite often and they can be a great benefit, but just make sure they are being cleaned, very important. So that concludes my portion of the presentation and we will be taking your questions in a bit. Thank you. Hello, my name is Caitlin Stowe and I'm the Clinical Research Manager for PDI Healthcare. I'm excited to be participating in this AORN Virtual Expo with PDI. As an infection preventionist, I have been involved with the implementation of practice guidelines and the difficulties that can sometimes be encountered. In this presentation, I'm going to highlight a couple of the new recommendations from the ARN Surgical Attire Guideline and ways that you can achieve compliance. Stethoscopes and mobile devices have long been an issue for infection preventionists. However, the new AORN Guideline for Surgical Attire now addresses and makes recommendations around the cleaning of those specific items. As you can see, all of these items must be cleaned with an appropriate cleaner according to their manufacturer's instructions for use. Hand hygiene and the appropriate personal protective equipment, or PPE, should also be used to further minimize contamination after cleaning. As Dr. Spruce has previously said, there is moderate quality evidence that demonstrates that cell phones, tablets, and other personal handheld devices are highly contaminated with microorganisms, some potentially pathogenic. Further supporting this issue, an article in the Journal of Bone and Surgery found that 83% of orthopedic surgeons had pathogenic bacteria on their phones when they entered the OR. In addition, 17% of physicians reported never cleaning their devices, which is extremely concerning when 86% of clinicians reported using a smartphone during the course of their work day. Stop and think about it. When was the last time you cleaned your screen? To help combat the contamination of these touch screens, researchers recommend regular cleaning of these devices. And along with the new AORN guidelines, these recommendations beg the question to be addressed. What is the cleaner that's appropriate for these items? That's where PDI Easy Screen Wipes come in. Easy Screen Wipes are a 70% isopropyl alcohol cleaner. This means that not only is it able to clean most mobile devices and touchscreens in healthcare, you're also able to clean other pieces of personal attire when following the manufacturer's instructions for use. Using Easy Screen Wipes to clean these items before providing patient care decreases the microbial burden on these items and could potentially remove pathogens that could potentially cause infections in patients. In addition, we have great news. 70% isopropyl alcohol is now approved by Apple to clean all the devices you see listed on this table. This means that you can use easy screen wipes on your Apple products without fear of degradation or other issues. PDI Easy Screen Cleaner is approved for a variety of technologies and touchscreens that provide vital health care. 
you can feel confident that using PDI EasyScreen according to the manufacturer's instructions for use will help you protect your staff and patients by removing potential pathogens. Thank you both. Lots of great information.